It's not five o'clock, and they don't care. Welcome to Wine to Five. Entertainment, education, and everyday drinking for everyday people. Your hosts are Valerie Caruso and Stephanie Davis, two wine educators who don't need a clock to know when to pour that next glass. Hello, Wine to Fivers. Val here without Steph. And it's weird. Not the drinking alone part. I do that all the time. Just the no Steph part. Some of you may know that she's been battling pneumonia, so we were unable to record some fresh and germ-free episodes for you, but have no fear, listeners. Steph is on the mend, and she's on her way to New Zealand. Yeah, who feels sorry for her now, huh? Yeah, that's what I thought. But seriously, we wish her a fabulous trip, and you'll hear her voice on next week's episode with Rick Fisher. This is an interview we recorded back in November, and then she will be back with us behind the mic on January 25th when we record our next episode. But this week, we're going to move up an interview that we were saving for later this month. It is with Cassidy Havens, Senior Account Supervisor at Two In Communications, which is a PR agency for food, wine, and spirits. Cassidy completed the WSET Diploma in January 2017 at the International Wine Center in New York, and we're going to put her full bio and contact information as well as some pictures in the blog. But for the purposes of this interview... Here's what you need to know. She's been working with Wines of Alsace for six years, and that's where we pick it up this week. Cassidy made time during the Busy Wine Bloggers Conference to talk to me about Alsace, and I cannot wait to share this interview with her because Alsace is one of those really unique wine regions located way in the far northeastern part of France, right on the German border. Actually, it used to be part of Germany, many times, in fact. But that's just scratching the surface on what makes this region and the wine so fascinating. Cassidy is going to fill us in on some unique aspects of this region and why we should seek out these wines, learn about the styles, and why it's also a great place to start your wine study. So without further ado, please enjoy this interview with Cassidy Havens on the Wines of Alsace. We're here with Cassidy Havens of Tuin. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about Tuin and then tell yes. us a little bit about yourself? Yes. So Tuin Communications is a public relations agency. Um, we're based on the east and west coast in New York and now in the Bay Area as well. Um, I just moved out to our Bay Area office in June to uh, work on new business and also our clients that we currently have. So one of our biggest clients is Wines of Alsace, and we've been working with them for Ooh, longer than I've been there, but I've been uh, working on that account for close to six years now. Really love it. And just a little bit about me. I finished my diploma studies um, in January this year. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, it was a long time coming, and I'm kind of glad that it's over, but it was a great experience. But before that, I was going to college at New York University for media and communication, and I just had a huge interest in journalism and communications. Came out of that and was working in music for a little while and got an opportunity to work in food and wine, public relations. Had not had too much experience with wine. I had studied abroad um, in the Czech Republic, where they have wine that's cheaper than water, so yeah. I did that. I uh, tasted a lot of wine there, but I got this opportunity to intern at the company that I'm at now, actually, and I fell in love with it, and I wanted to continue my wine education, um, so pretty much immediately got into WSET studies. And All right, and which school did you go to? I went to the International Wine Center Okay, in the one in yeah. New York. It's, mm-hmm. It's a big school. Yeah. I, in fact, I had lunch with a couple of people who'd been there as well, worked on their uh, WSET there as well. Yeah, yeah. So very it's a great school. school. Yeah. yeah. Now, have you been to Alsace? I have uh, three times Oh, now. so jealous. It's a wonderful region, and I love it even more than I can whenever I go back. So well, we're yeah. going to get into what your favorites are and what it is you love about Alsace yes. and ma- what made you want to represent. I'm excited to talk about it. <laughs> yes. So let's start with what's unique about Alsace, because I think a lot of people, when they see Riesling, first of all, they think Germany. Mm-hmm. And exactly. as far as the way the wines are labeled, the way they're bottled, what is unique about Alsace when it comes to French wine regions? So <laughs> for French wine regions, the very first thing that's unique about Alsace is that they label by variety, which mm-hmm. all of their French regions, they'll label by the place that the wine comes from. So Chablis, for instance, and people may not know the variety that 
goes into Chablis. But Alsace, it's very easy. It's Riesling, Pinot Blanc, Pinot Gris, right on the label. So it's a it's a good way to label for American consumers um, and those who are used to buying New World style wines because mm -hmm. they immediately recognize that grape variety. The second thing that's unique is that Alsace has some Germanic grape influence because they've flopped back and forth throughout the years right. um, from being French to German. I think it's four different times that they've changed. Four to six, something like yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. At least in the past 100 yes. years or yes. 150 years. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> so that's definitely unique about them. Um, so Gewürztraminer, Riesling. Yeah, those are the two two main Germanic varieties. And then you've got Pinot Blanc uh, and Pinot Gris that's coming over from Burgundy. Right, so, yeah. right. And yeah. they have, is it still seven? Seven main varieties. Seven there, main. there are a few more, but they're in such small yeah. quantities that they don't really make it onto the U.S. market the that Chafla, much. The Chafla, the Clevner, yeah, exactly. and, Clevner, and what yeah. have you. <laughs> I, I'm obsessed with the Pinot Blanc and the Pinot Gris styles. Yes. I'll ask Pinot Gris because it, it can age a long time. They're so food friendly. And when I see them on a menu, I get so excited. Yes. They're powerful. They're opulent. They can pretty much go with any food. We like to call it the red drinker's white wine because it has a bit more of that body and it is actually pinkish in color, the grapes are, and you get that nice golden color to them. Um, and we really love to pair it with fall foods, especially oh, yeah. bacon, mushrooms, pork, anything like that. I was actually thinking about it earlier today. Um, I had had bacon wrapped dates last night, but devils on horseback with blue cheese, dates, uh, bacon wrapped. I feel like that would be perfect for a Pinot Gris because it's kind of, it has enough intensity and flavors that are happening to go with all that salty, sweet, savory elements. And oh you just kind of get everything from Pinot Gris. And I think that's a, why it's a great variety. It's so different than Pinot Grigio and that kind of simple profile it just offers a lot I think a lot of people don't realize what a little skin contact can do to exactly a agree yeah. you know especially mm -hmm. when it comes not just to the color because you're right it's it's a bluish mm -hmm. copper colored yep. grape and yep. it just makes amazing wines but I think what our listeners might be interested to know is how Alsace Rieslings are different from a Riesling from Germany versus a Riesling from the Pacific Northwest mm -hmm. so first of all Alsace Riesling uh, Alsace Rieslings are normally dry. Mm -hmm. um, you can find some with a bit more weight, but anything that you're going to buy on the shelf in the U.S. at least is pretty dry. But another thing that makes them or sets them apart from other regions is that Alsace has 13 different terroir. And Riesling is a grape that just kind of soaks up that minerality. That it really wants to express the soils. So you get a lot of different profiles from these soil types in Alsace. So, for instance, volcanic uh, in the Rangan, which is the southernmost Grand Cru and the steepest in Alsace, you get these kind of smoky, briny notes. And whenever I was in Alsace in June, we did a tasting of all of the producers that grow on the Rangan. And you could really tell, even though it was the producer's distinct style, you still kind of had this undertone of the soil coming through and everything, this briny, smoky note that tied them all together. And... It's the same with granite. It's the same with limestone soils there, calcareous soils. Um, you really get this through line in the wines that are made in each vineyard site and on a specific soil. Okay, so this is kind of a, a question off, off the beaten path here because mm -hmm. that's how I roll. Um, 13 different soils in all yes. this. Have you tasted them all? You know how, how wine people like to eat dirt? Do, yeah. have, you, have you tasted the dirt? I haven't tasted all of them. <laughs> That's a silly but question, but yeah, you did, right? Yeah. 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 Um, but the, the main ones that come into the U.S., like there's the Schlossberg, which is on granite soils. You get Hanks, which is marl, limestones, and some clay. Uh, and then there's Rangan, which is volcanic. Those are kind of the the main uh, Grand Cru that you see here. There are a few others that are also pretty well known, but just those three, if anyone can find them in a store, I'm sure they can pick up all three and just taste through. You can definitely see the diversity of Alsace just with one variety, Riesling. Right. Yeah. That is really exciting. Now there is more to Alsace and Riesling. We talk mm -hmm. about the Gewürztraminer. We've talked about the Pinots. Yes. There's also red wine made there. Yes, one, one. Uh, Pinot Noir. That's it's right. It's there. It's 
pretty easy <laughs> for Alsace. If you see red, if you see rosé, it's always going to be Pinot Noir. That's right. Um, because they do make Cremant Rosé. Mm -hmm. It's easy. You know what it's going to be in the bottle because there's only one gra red grape variety there. And, and that brings me to my next point, that it's not just dry table wines or, you know, still wines mm -hmm. or light wines, if you're in the diploma program, that, exactly. that come into play. We have the dessert styles and we have the Cremant, which as listeners, you may remember, Cremant is made in the style of the classic method or traditional method. Yep. It's just made outside of champagne. So we can't call it method champenoise. Exactly. But tell us about the dessert styles, because I think those are really exciting. Yes, so there's Vendange Tardive, VT for short, and Selection de Grain Noble, which is, we just call it SGN here because it's kind of a mouthful. It is. If you don't have any French language experience, and mine is very limited. Yeah, but yeah. SGN and VT. VT is a late harvest wine, so it can have some botrytis or noble rot, which is, you know, a little mold that gets mm -hmm. on the grapes there and kind of a... Um, shrivels them down and concentrates them. Whereas SGN, those are only um, Botrytis, okay. only Noble Rot. That's um, the difference between the two. So VTs can, they're, they can be less sweet. SGNs are pushing 200, 300, maybe more grams residual sugar, very concentrated, but both of them have an acidity that keeps the freshness. I would say VTs are a bit easier to drink regularly because okay. they're not as sweet whereas SGN they're just you want it with cheese oh, at the end of the cheese meat. maybe yeah. Yeah. yeah delicious some of my favorite wines and sweet wines they don't get a lot of love in the U.S. but if people just buy you know a 375 of it they're not too expensive VTs tend to be less expensive than SGN right. just because it takes less labor right. to produce them um SGN, you're going through the vineyard three, four, five, six, seven times, depending on uh, how the noble rod is developing. But just grab a bottle of VT and see if you like it. You can maybe get them for 20 bucks a half bottle, 25, depending on the producer. Yeah, and have a glass after dinner. It's People should drink more sweet wine. That's what I think. And that's what Tim Hanai <laughs> says, too. I don't know if you're familiar with his uh, campaign mm -hmm. or yes. his crusade, I should say, yes. to get people to drink what they like. Exactly. And, and what a lot of people don't realize that all sweet wine doesn't have to be cheap, hooch. You know, you can actually have an elegant uh, dessert wine, yes. uh, you know, a VT or an SGN, and you take that to somebody's house and you tell them the story behind that wine and maybe break out some a Munster or some yeah. stinky cheese or something. Yeah. But I did hear once that Gavart's Charminer from Alsace and Munster cheese is probably the best 15 minutes of your life. Oh, yes, it is. Tell us why. Yes. I know that's an unscheduled yeah. question, but... <laughs> if you've never had Gavart's Charminer, it's very heady. It's, a, it's kind of an in-your-face wine, very aromatic, has a lot of spice, pepper, uh, tropical fruits, ginger... Um, so some people can kind of be uh, a little turned off by it sometimes because it's so out there. But with Munster, which is a very pungent, sticky cheese too, they balance perfectly. Yeah, and there's Whereas, not a lot of acidity in the yeah, Govart's Traminer exactly. as, as compared to the Riesling as well. Exactly. So the acidity tends to be lower, but there tends to be a bit of bitterness in Govart's Traminer that really balances that out. It kind of it kind of acts the way that acidity does and kind of a good finish for your palate. Okay, yeah. and I have one more, well, two more questions. The first one has to do with the single varietal wines, like we mm -hmm. talked about. Those are typical, made with one variety, either Riesling, Gavard's Traminer. It was actually the first region in France to do this, right? Yes. Outside Languedoc, Roussillon, yes. I think now. Mm -hmm. And now they're the only other region that grows Riesling legally, as yes. far as I know. Yes, the only AOC Riesling in right. France. Yeah. And other than that, it used mm -hmm. to only be Alsace, which also yes. made it special. But the question that I have for you is they do blends yes, in they Alsace. Do. Mm -hmm. Talk about words like Edelswicker and Gentil. Yes, so Edelswicker. Edelswicker, um, excuse yes. me. <laughs> I mean, who knows if I'm pronouncing it correctly, but um, <laughs> it literally translates to noble blend. Uh, Zwicker means blend in Alsatian, and Edel is for noble. Mm -hmm. um, so historically, that meant that there were more noble varieties, which are Riesling, Muska, Gewürztraminer, and Pinot Gris added in. But that's kind of been flipped on its head these okay. days. Um, Edelsvicker now can just be 
any Alsace variety, AOC variety um, in the blend. It can be, the varieties can be vinified together or separately and it doesn't necessarily need a vintage. Um, I think one of the biggest producers of Edel's Vicar that you'll see in the U.S. is Albert Boxler. Okay. It's actually an amazing uh, Edel's Vicar, and I think it's around 30 bucks. So Jean T, which is the other blended wine, it has to have 50% of the noble varieties. So All again, right. Riesling, Muscat, Gewürztraminer, Pinot Gris, and the other 50% is either Sylvaner, Pinot Blanc or Chasselas. Okay. Yes. All right. So even though Edel's Vicar means noble blend, it does, there's not a certain percentage that it needs to have. Um, whereas Jean T has these rules that they have to follow. Also, the varieties have to be vinified separately. They have to go through a tasting panel, and there needs to be a vintage on it. All so right. Jean T is a little bit more regulated, but that doesn't mean that there aren't great Edel's Vicar like Albert Boxler's. Two of the producers that bring Jean T into the U.S. are Hugel, which of course it's a lot yes. of people's first foray into. It is, and it's Alsace widely wine. available. Yes, yes, very widely available, and also Vilm, which is W I L L M. Mm-hmm. Um, they bring in one as well. Okay, doesn't Adam bring in one as well? I think they do. Yeah. I think they do. There might be a couple of other producers that bring some in in pockets, but those are the two more right. widely available ones that I've seen. Now, since you are very knowledgeable about Alsace, the thing that's always confused me was, and I know this isn't in our questions here, but Pinot Blanc and the, the Klevner. Oxerwa. What is going on with that, with so, the labeling there? Could you kind of, could you have a simple way of breaking that down for somebody like me who can't get it through my thick skull? <laughs> it is, it is a confusing point for Alsace. So basically in Alsace, Pinot Blanc can mean Pinot Blanc is in the bottle. Mm-hmm. Oxerwa is in the bottle 100% mm-hmm. or a blend of the two okay. are in the bottle. Just because when they were harvesting grapes, Oxerwa looks so similar and has such a similar profile to okay. Pinot Blanc that they were just called the same thing, essentially, even though it is technically a different variety. That's what it is. Um, okay. Yeah. So they do have a similar profile. Uh, Oxerwa tends to have a bit more body, okay. which it gives some weight to the Pinot Blanc wines. You can find 100% Oxerwa here. Albert Mann makes mm-hmm. one, but that's essentially what it is. Okay. Pinot and Blanc I, and is the that. one. So Pinot Blanc can have Oxerwa. Oxerwa doesn't necessarily have Pinot Blanc in it. Exactly. If, right. it, if it says Oxerwa on the label, then it's 100%, 100% Oxerwa. Right on. But Pinot Blanc can just be kind of any variation okay. All right. one, from 100% Pinot Blanc to 100% Oxerwa. It's the, the one kind of anomaly there in Alsace with the varietal okay. labeling but I think that's so interesting yeah. <laughs> okay before I go I'm going to ask you one last question we ask all our guests this and I didn't tell you I was going to do this because it's fun <laughs> we always ask our guests to tell an embarrassing wine story and I'm guessing that you probably have one whether it made you feel like all right, I live to tell about it another day, or I always use the example, I walked into a glass door during wine service with my face and broke my nose. Oh yeah, and blood, <laughs> the whole thing. And my, my partner, uh, Steph, she dropped a tray of stems, getting her sommelier certification, all bubbly and stemware everywhere. And you heard Jennifer's, Simone yes. Bryan's. So yes. do you have a story like that you could share with our listeners? I don't have anything quite as <laughs> traumatic. <laughs> but whenever I was still doing diploma, I decided to take a unit four, five, and six all on the same day. Hardcore listeners. Yeah, so I did pass them all, but during the first, the very first uh, tasting, which I think was sparkling first, Mm -hmm. I ended up spilling uh, Lambrusco all on my white shirt. Of course it was white shirt. So I spent the entire time just taking bubbles from the glass and like obsessively rubbing out the stain on my shirt. And I was like, why am I doing this? I should just be concentrating on the wine. Yeah. But I don't know, just obsessively rubbing out the stain and by the end of the day it was it was gone thanks to the sparkling wine sparkling wine probably, good stain remover yeah i probably spent half or used half of my bubbles just rubbing out this stain 
That's on my funny. shirts. Instead so. of doing the, because you only have a limited time to write exactly. these tasting notes. <laughs> you know, and, and I have to give you props for three exams in one day. I was just talking to somebody who was taking it, and I said, you know, I didn't learn my lesson taking five and six at the same day, mm-hmm. so I took sparkling and fortified. And then six months later, I go back and decide, oh, I'm going to take units one and four together. Yeah. And That's they're like, crazy. yeah, you didn't learn your lesson, but you took three in one day. That is hardcore. I didn't even know you could do that. They, they recommend to not, but I was ready to be, I was just so excited to be done. Fist <laughs> bump, girl. Thanks. Wow, props. Anything else you would like to add about um, Alsace, your love for Alsace, the wines, favorite pairings, anything at all? Uh, yeah, so <laughs> for me, getting into wine, Alsace was actually my first foray into wine. Really? Which is kind of backwards for, for some people. So... I had no reference of the classic regions like Bordeaux, Burgundy, but for me, Alsace was actually a great entry because it's a region that can grow with your level of knowledge. Uh Whenever I first started working on it, there were three AOCs, which has since changed. Now they're 51 because, or 53 because of the 51 Grand Cru, Mm -hmm. but they were labeling by variety. It was a region in France. They have excellent quality for value. So you know, me being someone fresh out of college, um, I was able to buy, you know, a bunch of bottles for 20 bucks and I was never disappointed in a right. single one. Um, and then as I, my wine knowledge grew, I was able to learn more and go deeper into these Grand Cru's and these soil types and kind of everything that makes Alsace what it is. Um, so that's, for anyone getting into wine, I think... <laughs> Go with Alsace first. Like, I agree. Just try it. Everybody starts with Bordeaux and Burgundy, yeah. and they get discouraged because yeah. it's so complicated. Exactly. So but, what a great piece of advice. Yeah, <laughs> yeah start, you know, because we always start in France because we always say it's the mothership calling us home, mm-hmm. you know, when it comes to wine exactly. regions. And everybody starts with Bordeaux, and I tend to save those regions for last because they're just so complicated. And, and a lot of the wines that are the kind of the icon wines from Bordeaux or Burgundy tend to be out of... Price a range. Lot of people's price range, unless you're a sommelier on the floor and you get to take like at a really nice place and you right. get to taste these regularly. Right. Um, for someone just getting into wine, I think Alsace is a great region because you can actually afford the wines. Even the Grand Cru with the highest tier, you know, you can find some for over a hundred bucks, but most of your Grand Cru are going to be around 40, 50 bucks, which is an amazing bargain. You can barely find any good burgundy for that price these days. That's true. And one more point, because I can't shut up. And and I love Alsace so much, but there are producers who do make Grand Cru quality and and produce wines from Grand Cru vineyards who don't use the label. Exactly. Yes. Do you know why that is? Yeah, it's a little bit of a controversial controversial story. Basically, there were some people who didn't think that or thought that the Grand Cru's were a little bit too big okay, um, and thought that maybe there were some parcels that shouldn't be part of it. So they decided to not use Grand Cru on their label. However, that's changing now. Yes. The three producers who had previously not done that, which were Trimbach, Hugel, and I'm blanking on the third. Mayor? Leon Baer. Yes, okay. Leon Baer was the third. They're now reconsidering that and adding Grand Cru onto their labels. So right. uh, Trimbach just came out with one this year I think it's on the market and Hugel has one as well wonderful already on the market gosh well I can't thank you enough Cassidy for yeah, sitting down you. with us this and great. yeah absolutely it was a pleasure meeting you pleasure meeting you as well thank you thank you for listening to the wine to five podcast be sure to check us out at facebook slash wine two5 and tune in next week for more fun and useful sip tips